Pseudogenes and Functions, part one. I was alerted to the article that we're reviewing today and next week um, by a uh, title that runs uh, Nature's Reviews, Genetic Pseudogene Function is Prematurely Dismissed in Evolution News in January 7 of this year. The article references a, uh, an article in Nature Reviews Genetics called Overcoming Challenges and Dogmas to Understand the Functions of Pseudogenes. And um, you can get the abstract at nature.com. If you want the actual article, you're going to have to either have a subscription or go to a library that has one or uh, have an in with a library that has one. Uh, but it is available now. And uh, we're going to begin with the abstract because it's a pretty good abstract, tells you what the article is all about. First half of the abstract reads, pseudogenes are defined as regions of the genome that contain defective copies of genes. They exist across almost all forms of life and in mammalian genomes are annotated in similar numbers to recognize protein coding genes. Now, that term annotated is a technical term. It means people recognize that they're pseudogenes. Um, that's what we think they are. Although pre often presumed to lack function, growing numbers of pseudogenes are being found to play important biological roles. In consideration of their evolutionary origins and inherent limitations in genome annotation practices, we posit that pseudogenes have been classified on a scientifically unsubstantiated basis. That almost sounds like the authors, and there are three of them, believe in uh, evolutionary origins, but it sounds like the assumption of evolution has misled people. And that's probably accurate. We reflect that a broad misunderstanding of pseudogenes perpetuated in part by the pejorative inference of the pseudogene label. Remember, pseudogene just comes from the Greek pseudos, which means liar. That is, people think they're genes and they're really not. Um, has led to the frequent dismissal from functional assessment and exclusion from genomic analysis. With the advent of technologies that simplify the study of pseudogenes, we propose that an objective reassessment of these genomic elements will reveal valuable insights into geno genome function and evolution. Well, I would agree with both of those. I think that one of the valuable functions might be that evolution isn't the major driving force, but that's a different question than what they're asking. What he's actually saying is that these are pseudo-pseudogenes. People think they're pseudogenes, they're really not. Or most of them aren't. Uh, introduction, this term pseudogene was first used in 1977 by Jacques et al. to describe a truncated 5S ribosomal RNA gene in Xenopus lavis, that's a frog. And similarly truncated gene copies have since been found to be a common feature in 5S RNA gene repeat regions in metazoans. It's all over the place. It's found in the frog, but you can find this everywhere. And basically this is a piece of, uh, of ribosome that's made out of RNA, and it's just encoded in DNA in the nucleus. And uh, it isn't totally coded in this particular copy. Now, there are good copies, but this is a defective copy, if you want to put it that way. In the absence of evidence that the 5S pseudogenes were transcribed, Jacques et al. concluded that mo the most probable explanation for the existence of the pseudogenes is that they are a relic of evolution and are functionless. So far, kind of logical. The only problem is that people went from they're probably to they're definitely, 
and wrote that particular one and wrote uh, other pseudogenes off as being functionless. Since the coining of the term pseudogene, its definition has broadened and is now widely accepted to define any genomic se sequence that is similar to another gene and is defective. Defective meaning it doesn't do what the other gene does. And we don't know what it does. And so we assume it doesn't do anything because after all evolution puts, puts out junk. Pseudogenes are classified by their mechanism of origin. The two major classes are processed pseudogenes derived from retrotransposition of processed RNAs, figure 1A, and unprocessed pseudogenes derived from segmental duplication, and it needs to say and corruption. And I'll give you uh, the two examples they give. Um, I've rearranged the figure 1 so that these two uh, can be put next to each other. A processed pseudogene Normally, you produce a protein by cutting out the introns, stitching the exons together, making an mRNA, and then the body adds a big tail of adenosine at the end. Yeah, that's the same thing that's adenosine triphosphate or ATP. Um, body uses things over and over for different uh, uh, purposes. And then what happens is reverse transcriptase takes that processed gene without the introns and sometimes with that tail and puts it back into um, the genome. And we know that sometimes this happens because we have people, some with and some without, which we'll get to. Uh, 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 some of these uh, processed uh, genes. On the other hand, although I guess technically it could be omission on, in some people's parts, uh, but <coughs> on the other hand, um, the assumption that everyone that comes out this way is because the body omitted it uh, and transcribed everything back is actually an unproven assumption and we'll talk about that probably some next week. Then there are the unprocessed pseudogenes where you have a gene and then you duplicate it. And you have to keep one of those running but the other one if it happens to wind up with de deletions, insertions, uh, changes in the code uh, it can wreck the code, but on the other hand, the other one that it was copied from keeps on going the way it's supposed to. So that is called an unprocessed pseudogene. How do we know that happens? Well, that's an interesting question and we'll get to that. Unitary pseudogenes, this is a third type, are a minor class that are formed without duplication when a single original gene is inactivated through mutation such that no functional copy of the gene remains. A fourth class of rare pseudogenes are those that have disabling mutations in the reference genome but are intact in some individuals. So unitary pseudogene means that instead of having multiple copies, some of which are corrupted, you have only one copy but it's been damaged enough that it no longer puts out the protein that it does in other related animals, for example. Um, and so that person or, or that uh, animal does not have an active gene because it's been inactivated. And then there's finally the kind where, well, well <laughs> they pick somebody who had an inactivated gene. But it turns out that other people or other animals in the same group um, have a perfectly functional gene and the, the person that's a reference sequence has actually got an error in their, uh, or several errors, if you like, in their uh, genome. And so that is, I guess you could really say, a pseudo-pseudo gene. Because what we thought was the normal actually wasn't. 
GenCode, a large-scale project that aims to annotate all gene features in the human genome with high accuracy, identifies 10,668 processed pseudogenes in the human genome, accounting for 72% of all human pseudogenes. So most of them are processed genes, almost three quarters. However, exact numbers differ with frequency ranging from about 8,000 to about 13,000. This is the first time I've ever seen reference seven like this, references eight or nine. I guess that's because if you put the seven right behind the 8,000, it looks like 8,000 to the seventh power, which is not what they want. Um, <clears throat> depending on annotation methodology. As a critical mechanism underpinning biological evolution, Process pseudogene formation is ongoing in human evolution with at least 48 retrotransposed gene copies, retrocopies, that are polymorphic in the human population. Some people have them, some people don't. Annotations of metazoan genomes typically describe between 10,000 and 20,000 regions as pseudogenic. So our 8,000 to 13,000 is about average maybe a little low. The binary distinction between gene, genes and pseudogenes forms a central theme in genome annotation and ultimately informs the reference lists of genes of an organism. Now, this is important because once you say something is a pseudogene, you can ignore it. Because after all, it doesn't really belong there. Consequently, the annotations of genomic regions as pseudogenes constitutes an etymologic signifier that an element has no function and is not a gene. As a result, pseudogene annotated regions are largely excluded from functional screens and genomic analysis. So you just, people who are looking for disease kind of ignore those areas. Therefore, the process of pseudogene annotation is paramount in the consideration of which genomic elements are, assembled, uh, are assessed for biological impact. Which means, that I guess, once a pseudogene, always a pseudogene, nobody looks at it anymore to see if it might be the cause of whatever syndrome. However, with a growing number of instances of pseudogene annotated regions later found to exhibit biological function, there is an emerging risk that these regions of the genome are prematurely dismissed as pseudogenic and therefore regarded as void of function. And that will tend to be self-perpetuating. Making a mistake on pseudogenes uh, is a science stopper. Due to recent maturation of several enabling technologies, we propose that the time is opportune for a reevaluation of the function of pseudogene annotated regions. We need to reconsider what's been labeled. The advent of long read transcriptomics enables the identification of dynamically active pseudogenes, and whole genome sequencing of large cohorts enables the identification of disease associated pseudogenes. Additionally, the CRISPR-Cas9 revolution allows straightforward interrogation of pseudogene functions. We can take them out, we can put them in, and we can see whether it makes a difference in the organism. And we'll see that, in fact, sometimes we can demonstrate that. In this perspective article, we systematically assess the process of pseudogene annotation and highlight the assumptions and limitations that are implicit in classification algorithms. We provide a critical analysis of the pitfalls of current approaches to annotating pseudogenes and describe how methodological limitations and largely arbitrary defined assumptions have inhibited research in pseudogene annotated regions of the genome. We're going to show how this is a science stopper. Finally, we consider the scientific utility of the pseudogene concept in the context of evolutionary biology and the dogma established through virtue of the term itself. We propose that the availability of new technologies and approaches to study gene and genome function together with the recalibration of how pseudogenes are perceived, we wanna fix this, 
will invigorate study into the biology of these regions of the genome. Identifying pseudogenes in eukarya. That's organisms with a nucleus. During initial annotations of the genic content of the human genome by ab initio gene annotation software, I'm interested that they don't italicize ab initio, uh, many pseudogenes are erroneously annotated as protein coding and their removal from gene annotations is considered a priority. So they need to stop calling these things pseudogenes. Annotation of a region as pseudogenic is largely sufficient for it to be excluded from functional consideration. Thus, the correct differentiation of gene from pseudogene is of crucial importance in genome biology. Pseudogenes in eukaryotic genomes are identified by computational pipelines and manual annotation. Pseudogenes are first identified by searches for sequences similar to known genes. You've got a ge known gene, you look for kind of sort of copies of it. How good are they? Uh, are they exact matches? Are they close enough matches? Do they have defects that will prevent them from being translated into protein? The absence of introns, so if you find something that has the exons all there but no introns, the occurrence of truncations, you cut it off part way, and disruptions to the open reading frame relative to the parent gene are the primary characteristics used to identify pseudogenes. They're supposed to be pr produce protein, but they can't, and they look like they've been processed. So that must mean that they're just mistakes. Importantly, I'm not gonna read everything here, but I'm gonna read most of it. Uh, importantly, the absence of introns and the absence of strong evidence of transcription are sufficient to identify a processed pseudogene. So if it isn't translated and it doesn't have introns, then it must be a pseudogene. Additionally, some processed pseudogenes do not harbor truncating mutations and have the same protein coding capacity as their parent genes. They could work. Indeed, 8.9% of recognized human protein coding genes do not contain introns and are likely to be derived from retrotransposition. What that means is, what they're calling pseudogenes, they don't really know that. There are some examples that look for all the world like pseudogenes, but they work. Thus, computational differentiation of pseudogenes from genes on a purely rule-based system is unlikely to be feasible as it will inherently conflict with many protein coding genes derived through gene duplication and retrotransposition that actually work. Accordingly, untrunca untruncated pseudogenes are often manually re-annotated as protein coding genes if they have demonst demonstrated function. And there's a few examples of that. They goofed it. It looks like a pseudogene, but it actually works, and therefore it can't be. Determination of the ratio of rates of non-synonymous substitution to synonymous substitution for pseudogenes is a proposed mechanism for assessing a coding, the coding potential of putative pseudogenes. Ratios substantially divergent from one, it's interesting to ask how substantially does it need to be, can be an indication of purifying selection if there's a lot of uh, synonymous substitution or positive selection if there's a lot of non-synonymous substitution. Synonymous means that you change the DNA but actually the protein that comes out of it looks exactly the same. Um, there are anywhere between one and six different uh, uh, DNA sequences that can lead to the same amino acid, depending on the amino acid you're talking about. However, this approach is uninformative for recently duplicated pseudogenes, because they're gonna look just like the original, which have not had sufficient time to diverge from their parent genes, 
Ooh. And how much is enough time? Do we need six million years? And for pseudogenes that are translated in different reading frames than their parent genes due to frame shifting insertions or deletions, or five prime truncations. That is, you start, well, you start at one end, and you get halfway in, or three quarters of the way, or one tenth of the way, and all of a sudden you have a stop code on, and, and that's all you get for translation. Evidence of transcription could be a useful metric to identify protein coding genes with intact open reading frames incorrectly annotated as processed pseudogenes. If it's transcribed, you think maybe it actually does work. However, determining the transcriptional state of pseudogenes is technically challenging, as will be discussed later. Therefore, we suggest that it may be useful to consider the annotation of pseudogenes in genomes as a prediction or hypothesis rather than a classification, which means you shouldn't be excluding it from analyses because you might be wrong. As discussed further below, the inherent semantic contradiction that arises when a pseudogene is found to have biological function, it is now a pseudo-pseudogene, raises the notion that the term pseudogene should be reserved for gene copies that have been empirically demonstrated to be defective, rather than indicated by algorithmic prediction alone. The fact that it looks like a pseudogene is not evidence, or not enough evidence anyway, that it in fact is one. Functional pseudogenes. Where pseudogenes have been studied directly, they are often found to have quantifiable biological roles. Poignantly, a 5S ribosomal RNA pseudogene similar to the first description of a pseudogene discussed above was recently demonstrated in humans to re induce an innate immune response to viral infection. And I'm sorry, 28 should have been put up there. Many further examples of pseudogene functioning through diverse mechanisms have since been described. You know what that means? The very first pseudogene discovered was a pseudo-pseudogene. It actually has a function and we can identify it. Retrocopies were presumed to be transcriptionally silent processed pseudogenes due to the loss of genomic cis-regulatory elements. And they give an example of PGK2, and it says although PGK2 has the hallmarks of a retrotransposed sequence, the absence of introns, a genomic polyadenylate tract, and target site duplications, did you get that? It has no introns, it has a poly A tail, and it has target site duplications. It looks for all the world like a pseudogene. It has no disruptions in its coding sequence and is expressed in the testis. If you were to test this in liver, or in connective tissue, or in respiratory epithelium, you probably wouldn't find a thing wrong with it. I mean, you wouldn't find anything produced. But you get it in the testis, and it's produced. You see how hard it is to be sure that there's no function to a pseudogene. Genome-wide analysis of human retrocopy expressed sequence tags reveals that more than 1,000 are likely to be transcribed, including 272 that have no disruption in their open reading frames. They work just fine. Intact retrocopies are now widely available, uh, widely recognized as important regulators of antiviral defense, neural function, and cancer, although I'd have to say that's not a positive in my book. Although the, these individual retrocopies have been reclassified as protein coding genes, many intact retrocopies remain annotated as pseudogenes. And the implication is, maybe they shouldn't be. Truncation relative to the parental open reading frame is not a definitive criterion for pseudogene non-functionality. Even if you find it that it stops halfway there, that's not good enough. 
In a striking a recent example, human-specific duplications of NOTCH2, NOTCH2NL is what they call them, were discovered to expand cortical neurogenesis. That is, part of what makes us humans and smart is that certain pseudogenes are actually pseudo-pseudogenes. They're working. NOTCH2NL is highly truncated, containing less than half of the intact NOTCH2 coding sequence. NOTCH2NL encodes the ligand binding domain, but not the transactivation domain. Isn't that kind of the definition of a defective copy? But apparently not. You and I would not be here without those <coughs> pseudogenes. By binding the notch ligand delta but not inducing transactivation, NOTCH2NL modulates the level of notch activity in the cortex. Similarly, a truncated protein encoded by a pseudo human pseudogene of SRGAP2 <coughs> can inhibit its parental gene. Thus, many pseudogenes may function as protein-coding genes despite truncation relative to their parent genes. So if you see something that's truncated, it does not necessarily mean that it doesn't work. There's a couple of really obvious and important examples that they're bringing up. Many pseudogenes contain a frequency of mutations that render them unlikely to be or incapable of being translated into proteins. However, such mutations do not necessarily preclude pseudogenes from performing a biological function. The first such function identified was for a pseudogene of neural nitric oxide synthesis in the snail, Limnia stagnalis. I don't know what it does. Apparently, it's some kind of a neurotransmitter. Um, most of you know about nitric oxide synthetase by the fact that it's necessary for getting erections. Um, and that's what um, uh, Cialis and uh, Viagra help uh, boost that. This pseudogene is transcribed antisense with respect to the parent gene and can form a stable RNA duplex in vivo. Inhibiting translation of the parent NOS mRNA. So it, it helps adjust the level to just the right level of, uh, uh, of nitric oxide synthetase. Subsequently, a myriad of RNA-based regulatory mechanisms have been described for pseudogenes, including processing into small interfering RNAs, otherwise known as siRNAs, uh, figure 2C, that may regulate their parents' genes, acting as a decoy for transcription factors, and most prominently as molecular sponges for microRNAs. And they give a couple, uh, three examples there. Now, you have to be careful about that. This hypothesis was generalized as a theory. The CERNA hypothesis of competitive endogenous RNA, which is what CERNA means, networks, where in changes in the level of an RNA influences the levels of RNAs that share microRNA target sites. However, the recent evidence has concluded that such competitive effects would require unphysiological levels of uh, competing transcripts. And therefore, it probably doesn't actually work exactly that way. One interpretation of generally low pseudogene transcription is that these pseudogenes would make particularly unsuitable candidates to exert strong regulatory effects by microRNA competition. Maybe it only takes weak effects, I don't know. Maybe we're barking up the wrong tree. Another mechanism through which pseudogenes can function is by influencing chromatin or genomic ar architecture. And this is one of the most interesting ones and um, pay special attention to this. HPB, HBBP1, a pseudogene re residing within the hemoglobin locus, enables the, that by the way stands for hemoglobin B pseudogene 1. Um, enables the dynamic chromatin changes that regulate expression of fetal and adult globin genes during development. 
Notably, although inhibiting HBBP1 transcription has no effect, you can make sure it doesn't produce any, um, any product, uh, any protein, Deletion of the genomic locus reactivates he fetal hemoglobin expression. If we didn't have this, we would have substantial amounts of fetal hemoglobin in our bloodstream, which is not as effective at carrying oxygen for adults as adult hemoglobin. Fetal hemoglobin has to scarf oxygen off of the mother. Um, we're supposed to be getting it from the air and you need a different hemoglobin for doing that. Now, notice that although inhibiting HPPB transcription has no effect, deletion of the genomic locus reactivates fetal hemoglobin expression. HPB1 DNA contacts, but not transcription, are required for suppressing the expression of fetal hemoglobin cells in adult erythroid cells. We're not sure exactly how this works. They've drawn something, and they've drawn it slightly inaccurately because gene B would be the fetal hemoglobin and gene A would be the adult hemoglobin, and really the pseudogene is between those two, and there's actually more than one, and in fact, there's, uh, I think, another one before that, and I know for sure that there's a delta in another spot. So it's a little more complex than the, than the uh, drawing shows, um, but, uh, and it may be uh, more complex even than, than what the revised drawing shows, uh, and maybe even a little different, although not much. Um, and uh, so the pseudogene is just sitting there not being transcribed, but having to do with the form in which the DNA takes. Another example in which pseudogenes may function intrinsically as DNA elements is by influencing chromosome stability. A study of the genomic architecture of the 22Q11.2 locus, which is associated with DeGeorge Velocardiofacial Syndrome, those of you who studied pediatrics way back when may remember that uh, syndrome, proposed that deletions of a pseudogene within the low copy repeat region could increase non-allelic homologous recombination, which in turn results in deletions that underlie the disease. In that case, the, the, uh, the pseudogene is actually doing a second order thing where its being there keeps the, keeps the DNA from rearranging itself. Pseudogenes can also produce pseudogene gene fusion transcripts. In prostate cancer, exons of the pseudogene KLP, KLKP1 are spliced into the adjacent KLK4 gene, creating a novel fusion product. Now, that's an interesting thing, although I'm not sure that I would consider that a positive um, function of a pseudogene, but whatever. Polymorphic retrocopies can also form fusion con uh, transcripts if they are located in the intron of a gene. For example, a polymorphic retrocopy of CBX3 located in an intron of C CCDC32 results in a chimeric transcript of unknown function in some individuals. Pseudogenes can also transfer deleterious alleles to their parental genes by non-allelic recombination or gene conversion. Pseudogene-mediated gene conversion underlies cases of hereditary pancreatitis, adrenal hyperplasia, polycystic kidney disease, cataracts, and a multitude of other diseases. Without going into any of those in detail, um, I have the same concern as I had with the other one with prostate cancer. It doesn't sound like a positive thing to have, but um, I suppose that one would have to go into them and find out exactly what's going on there. Copy number variations in pseudogenes can also contribute to human disease. Uh, increased copy number in the NOTCH2NL, which is, I think we've seen that one before, region is associated with autism and microcephaly. You have too much of it, that's what happens. Whereas deletions, too little of it, are associated with microcephaly and schizophrenia. So you have your choice. Again, there's a reference. <coughs> 
Uh, most strikingly, a deletion in the pseudogene FAAHP1 was recently linked to the complete pain insensitivity of a patient. So you don't have that pseudogene, you can't feel pain, that's obviously not a good thing. The frequency of disease causing pseudogene variants is undetermined. Analysis of human exomes typically exclude pseudogenes. So you're, you're doing all this analysis and you're just ignoring the fact that these things might have uh, some function. Similarly, non-coding regions of the genome, including pseudogenes, were rarely considered when linking polymorphisms detected by genome-wide association studies to genes. You're not even looking at these things to see if they make a difference. Recently, numerous long non-coding RNAs were identified overlapping uh, disease-associated loci in apparent gene deserts. Area where there are no genes, there are these pseudogenes that they are ignoring, and it turns out that variations in this area can cause disease. And we're probably ignoring the pseudogenes at our scientific peril and possibly our uh, personal peril. It is expected that further links between human pseudogene polymorphisms and complex diseases will be identified in the coming years. There's probably more where all that came from. The examples of pseudogene function elaborated here, on here should not imply that pseudogene functionality is likely to be confined to isolated instances. At least 15% of pseudogenes are transcriptionally active across three phyla, many of which are proximal to conserved regulatory regions. It is estimated that at least 63 new human-specific protein coding genes were formed by retrotransposition since the divergence from other primates. Now, stop and think about what that really means is that there are 63 new human-specific protein coding genes that look like pseudogenes that function at least to produce protein and that have popped up in humans and not in chimpanzees or gorillas or whatever. That's an awful lot of fast evolution. Or maybe it was design, but numerous retrogenes continue to be recognized as functional protein coding genes rather than pseudogenes across species. In other words, they're not actually pseudogenes. High throughput mass spectrometry and ribosomal profiling approaches have identified hundreds of pseudogenes that are translated into peptides. Although the functions of these peptides remain to be experimentally determined, such examples illustrate the challenge in substantiating a gene pseudogene dichotomy. Because the whole point of doing this is so you can say, oh, this is a pseudogene, ignore it. Whereas, turns out it's not that simple. Now, next week we'll pick up uh, and caveats of the pseudogene form. Uh, for right now, I'm going to, besides the comments we've already made reading this thing, I'm going to turn to an interesting historical uh, uh, criticism. There's a guy named Gary Gilbert who wrote an article in Spectrum called In Search of Genesis and the Pseudogene in 1993. And the gist of the article was that eta pseudoglobin or HBB P1, that's not what they called it back then, but uh, in fact, acid globin is between the other two. Um, I think originally it was just beta uh, pseudoglobin, and it turned out that it's very similar to hemoglobin eta in sheep and so forth. It is nearly identical in chimpanzees and humans. And so God wouldn't have created the same non-functional DNA in both creatures. And therefore, the only other way for them to get it is to have inherited it from a common ancestor. And so evolution provides a perfect explanation for how both chimps and humans came to have identical useless DNA. 
And that was, that's the major point that he was making. Now, back then, Gilbert sounded convincing, and at the time, uh, somebody named James Gibson, that some of you know, head of the GRI right now, wrote a reply called Pseudogenes and Origins, uh, in the journal Origins, um, and that's available on the net. Gilbert's original article is not, but it is available from the Loma Linda Library because it's part of the Adventist Heritage Collection. And the last few sentences of his article said, scientists will continue to learn more about how DNA sequences interact. They will undoubtedly discard some of their present ideas and discover new principles of genetics. Perhaps a purpose for pseudogenes will be one of them. So you can see one person is leaning pretty hard on pseudogenes to prove his point. The other person is saying, not so fast, maybe there's a function for pseudogenes, and in particular this one. Well, uh, at this point, I think you can say that Gibson's approach seems to have aged better than Gilbert's approach. And I think that this fact can give us confidence as we approach questions for which we do not presently have an obviously good answer. Maybe in 20 years or 30 years we will have a good answer and it's not worth throwing away the entire structure because of one apparent contradiction. Or as somebody else put it, we have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teachings in our past history. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Comment here and comment over there. Here. Okay. <clears throat> if... Um, if pseudogenes were um, a byproduct of the evolutionary process, uh, would that then imply there was fewer of them in the ancient past? That would be the first pass implication. Now I say the first pass because how good is evolution at cleaning out the genome? You see, every time you have a useless piece of genome, it costs you to reproduce it. All the energy that goes into making the little parts to, to make it work, and the energy to put those parts together to form the DNA. Uh, it means that you're wasting energy on something that's worthless. And if you have a mutation that just drops that out, then the mutation should have a selective advantage and therefore there should be a tendency and it's worth asking how good um, to slowly replace the old uh, stuff with new stuff that doesn't have to waste its time building useless uh, structures. The estimates right now though by some evolutionary scientists or more than 90 percent of the genome is pseudogenetic? Um, and it just seems to build over time in their the, model. The most authoritative old estimate was 90 percent. I'm not sure anybody wants to buy that at this point. Yeah there was a time uh, when people like Dawkins would say 97%. So it's 2% coding and then another 1% uh, for regulatory elements and the rest of it's all junk. That, that's the Dawkins estimate. I have to say that I think Dawkins is um, uh, biased in his estimate. That the best estimate from an old school uh, was probably Ono, and he said 90%. But 
then the ENCODE uh, data came along and now they're saying that probably 80% or more is functional. And uh, a guy by the name of uh, Grauer, uh, Dan Grauer from Houston, basically had a cat over it. Um, Cow is probably better. He, he, he was totally upset about this, uh, what he called the evolution-free gospel of en ENCODE. Because he said you can't keep these things in order unless they have a function that can be selected. And so there's no way that the genome could be 80%, let alone, you know, uh, let alone 95% functional. Uh, that it'd have to be more like, uh, you know, 20 or 10 or somewhere in that range. Uh, we actually had a Sabbath school over that once, and if you go back uh, far enough, I think you could find it. Um, it was a fascinating study. Uh, where basically he set evolution against ENCODE. If ENCODE's right, the strong implication is evolution is wrong. So, um, there are a lot of people who would say it's probably around of upwards of 50%. Uh, but Grauer points out, and I think rightly, that if they're right, that the, the standard theory of evolution will have to be severely modified if not discarded. Of course, he doesn't want to say it that way. He wants to say that it, evolution is right, therefore they can't be wrong, right. Um, but, you know, it all depends on whether your theory is more important or the facts are more important. We have a comment over here. I, I have several questions. Uh, first of all, how similar are the processes involved in DNA repair to CRISPR-Cas9 mechanisms? I don't know that we know yet. CRISPR is a bacterial enzyme. Um, so uh, it's possible that bacteria produce CRISPR that crosses the membranes of uh, eukaryotes and uh, is active. I, I think that's unlikely, but it could be ha true. Do eukaryotes have their own CRISPR-like stuff? There seems to be the ability to take a parallel uh, sequences and use them as templates for correcting each other. Um, and part of the indirect evidence for that is that you have so many parallels. Um, in particular in the Y chromosome, which is otherwise totally de you know, degenerating with no hope of correction uh, other than killing off the defective ones, um, that there are all these palindromes that read the same both ways, suggesting that there's, there's some utility to that kind of thing. And the palindromes are not just sitting there looking pretty. They actually have genes in those palindromes that can read either way, um, which implies that somehow the organism may be able to have kind of backup copies that it can either somehow survive without the full or maybe even do a little correction. But of course, the standard dogma was that, it, that no such correction is possible. 
but I don't really think anybody's going to take that dogma and uh, run with it uh, without at least putting it to the test. And it's pretty hard to figure out how you could put it to the test. I suppose you could go in and you could change some DNA, knock out a piece of it and see if it repairs with uh, intact DNA from somewhere else. Uh, my sense is that there's some kind of uh, evidence for that kind of a process, but I don't know the literature well enough to be able to say for sure. Well, an innate bias for me is that with the CRISPR mechanism possible, a intelligent designer, i.e. our creator, should have, would have had that in the tool chest. And I, I say that because I actually having been around this for a while, when the Globin pseudogene first came out, that was the big story. I, I wrote a paper on on that that was wondering if so called pseudogenes were a reservoir for genetic diversity. Because when you think of creation, particularly the human, a pair with the necessity to change in response to changing mechanisms, there has to be a source of variability. And maybe this is simply unexpressed DNA that a wise creator said, hey, this is going to be useful in the future, and I know how to activate it, even though no one else has figured it out yet. Well, that's a possibility for, uh, for in general. Uh, I don't think it's the whole story for hemoglobin HBB of course. P1 because apparently if you cut the thing out you no longer stop I mean you no longer have all adult hemoglobin or 98% or whatever it is with a little bit of delta left in uh, now you have um, like uh, you know, large amounts. I, d I, did, didn't, I didn't read the paper to see exactly how much, but large amounts of fetal hemoglobin expressed. Um, and fetal hemoglobin is obviously not the best for adults. And so you need, you need a structure gene without an actual product in order to keep, make that happen. Mm -hmm. Now, exactly what the mechanism is is not clear, but the proposal that's most popular right now is that it, it binds to some kind of thing and basically bypasses the uh, fetal hemoglobin. There are actually two fetal hemoglobin uh, uh, genes. Uh, maybe you need twice as much of them in order <laughs> to make it work, I don't know. Um, so the gamma hemoglobin genes are bypassed and they, and they go straight to the beta. Uh, and so there's a structural deal. Oh, you can think of it kind of like, okay, for the first nine months I want you to make fetal hemoglobin and then after that, I want you to make adult hemoglobin. Well, how do you make that work? Well, apparently that pseudogene is a major part of that. And it needs to be there. If you cut it out, mm -hmm. it doesn't work. Um, I guess the one thing that I would say is, you know, if on those four points that Gilbert was making, the very first point was wrong, which is it has no function. <laughs> And if it doesn't have function, then the fact that ours is similar to chimpanzees just means that we have a similar problem to chimpanzees. And so it needs to switch over. And so this is, this is like finding the same light switch in an airplane that you might find in a house. Good analogy. Um, and the other thing that struck me when I was looking at it way back when, before we knew for sure, well, there were two things. One of them is the original article actually wasn't as enthusiastic as Gary Gilbert was. And by that I mean that the original article kept saying 
that it's not mutating as fast as it ought to, and so it probably has some function. Probably has some function is not the same as saying it has no function. <laughs> it's not even quite in the same class. And the omission of that can be chalked up to blindness or can be chalked up to uncritical acceptance of, of somebody's standard theory or could be chalked up to willful blindness. I, I guess Gary Gilbert gets to answer to his creator for which one of those it is. Um, and I won't make a presumption. Uh, let's, well, let's make the nice presumption. He probably just, it was too good to check. Um, because the article that he, that he stole all this, uh, well, didn't steal, but you know, copied all this from, clearly had that implication. It probably did something. The other thing is that if you look at the gene itself, there is a mutation here, a mutation there. There's a frame shift in, I think, codon number 12, which throws everything off and puts a whole bunch of stop codons in it and everything. It just totally louses up trying to create a protein from it. Um, and there are two mutations in codon 1. What it reminds me of is an automobile that somebody has gone in and smashed the ignition and slashed the tires and left it there. And the clear implication is that it looks like it was designed to look pretty but not run. That's quite an analogy. I, I hear you. Uh, I, I have, I maybe struggled with the right word, but where is the blueprint in each of our bodies that can be used to repair DNA when it goes, when it goes, when it goes off? There has to be something recognized that says, hey, this is right. Uh, take the functional DNA and change it enough so it gets back to where it should be. Yeah. Uh, you have a couple of thymine dimers gone and then there's whatever is in between is gone. Now the DNA has to repair it and has to put it in some kind of reasonable shape. And it'd be a whole lot nicer if you had another copy over here that did the same thing. And you could just kind of, well, let's put that same thing in but here. But that copy has to be marked as the original. Or you end up making negative changes yes. in, in DNA editing. Yes. So there's, there's an awful lot we don't know. That is, it's there. But, and, uh, and I think that's one of the messages is that just because somebody spouts stuff that looks like it's coming from the latest stuff, I mean, after all, Gary Gilbert was trained at Harvard. I mean, what more do you want? Um, that sometimes a little skepticism regarding the latest scientific findings might be warranted. And, and like I say, um, uh, Gibson has worn much, much better yeah. than it's, Gilbert has. It's so interesting how we tend to take interpretations, conclusions, that we would not allow to pass in hardcore science as the answer. In other words, the absence of evidence that you're wrong cannot be used to say you're right, except it's done all the time. Is it possible that uh, one of those repair mechanisms hides away in one of those pseudogenes? Well, that's, I think, the suggestions you were making, isn't it? I guess I was looking for something a, l a little bit more than simply another gene copy. Yeah. Which is right and which is wrong. So yeah. it kind of has to be there. 
Well, you know, there are all kinds of interesting implications. Uh, we don't know what the, um, what the uh, new earth is going to be like, but there's going to be a tree whose leaves are for the healing of the nations. And you wonder if maybe there's some external stuff that we're supposed to be getting that can help correct DNA mistakes. Coming back to the one point, to me, it may be the most important is that for a small number of organisms to be created and yet have the diversity to adapt with change uh, demands something we don't understand. Because if, if the diversity were not there, imagine pre-flood, post-flood post conditions. It had massive extinctions. Well, Almost everything. Yeah. It, anyway, I'm done. Yeah, it, it's the thing of it is, it's um, we're we are very much like small children who kind of understand what their parents are doing, but not completely. And. Um, you know, if your father is a nuclear physicist and your mother is a neurosurgeon, they're going to talk to each other and some of that's just going to go right over your head and you kind of have to accept that that's part of what's going on and you kind of, you know, you're going to be put in a position where do you trust what they're doing is the right thing for you. And... Um, I guess maybe there might come some point where the evidence is pretty strong that it isn't, but if they've always been kind to you before, your first assumption probably should not be that they don't know what they're talking about and you better, uh, better fend on your own and not listen to them. And I guess that's part of it. it. You need to believe that they know what they're talking about. And if it's true in, in, in the human realm, you have to imagine that God's realm is so much further ahead of us, the smartest of us, than we are ahead of our kids. I really like that analogy. Uh, just. Imagine two siblings, maybe they're 12 or 13 years old, the age where you begin to realize that you're smarter than other people. Uh, arguing vehemently without the, the insight that, why don't we stop and ask us, maybe we're both wrong. And uh, uh, yeah. I, I, you know, one, one anecdote, that's absolutely impossible. <laughs> <laughs> One anecdote. Uh, at that age, and I cut my teeth on, my son, who's a very sharp guy, uh, would contradict about everything I said. And one day we had some friends over, and I was listening in under discussion, and I heard my son repeating exactly the argument that I'd given him that he rejected. <laughs> Dad, I had to know what you believed. <laughs> yes, yes. When I was 18, I left home. My old man was the stupidest guy on earth. Came back at age 25, and I was amazed at what the old guy had learned in just seven short years. <laughs> but it's only because you brought him up, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, there's more to this. There's the, I mean, this is the, this is the part about beta hemoglobin, and I thought it was interesting to have it in context. But there's another whole thing about what's a gene, what's a pseudogene, how do you define them, how do you, how do you find them, what should you do about them. Uh, should we ever class things, and if so, what, what criteria should we use to call something a pseudogene? And they're going to make an argument, and then the 
other article that I cited is going to make an argument that they haven't found the underlying problem. And that as long as you keep the underlying problem, there's going to continue to be this tension. That is, is the genome originally designed well and then deteriorated? Or is the genome gradually put together in a kind of general process? And I think Grauer is right, in fact. If it's put in a general process uh, that, that, that has no aim to it, then we should expect a bunch of junk. We should expect lots of pseudogenes not being actually worth something. And we should expect um, that we're going to see all kinds of junk, not just pseudogenes, but other stuff as well. On the other hand, if things are exquisitely designed, the more we look, the more we're going to be impressed with the levels of design that are just way beyond, uh, that, that what we expect is to see what uh, Bill Gates was quoted as saying, that DNA is like a computer program, only far sophisticated, more sophisticated than anything we've put together. That that's what you'd expect from a design perspective. And uh, I think that as long as one continues to insist that it's cobbled together, we should expect obvious cobbling, and we should expect stuff that's just thrown in as near misses. Uh, whereas if it's designed, then you'll see some degeneration from it, but, you will not, uh, but what you will not see is massive uh, degradation. That it really does make a difference whether the genome is 95% uh, useful or whether it is 10% useful. So could we test that hypothesis by um, basically testing or, or, or running the sequence of like the Iceman, who's obviously back a, a few thousand years, and then running against the current human DNA and see if we have actually had some degeneration and some I accumulation of additional excellent. pseudogenes? I think that would be excellent, and I think that's some of the, you know, one of the things that we should do is to start looking at what, uh, if we get old genomes, by one hypothesis, they should be better. By another hypothesis, they should be worse. And it will be fascinating to see how it, how it comes out. Although, whoever does it needs to include people from both groups in order to do it right. Because if you threw it at people for whom they already know the answer, they're going to just make assumptions. And the tragedy of it is that unless you go back to look at their actual data, the assumptions are what will be picked up and amplified. Which means that some of us who believe that uh, there was a designer should be actively engaged in trying to get some of that research done. Anyway, see you next week, and we'll talk about the philosophical end of things.